remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. Always heading off in the phone Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, can you all hear me, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Um, welcome to the first remote meeting of the Homes and Safe Scrutiny uh, Committee uh, on the 16th of September. Um, before we start the um, main agenda points, I was just going to go through some quick housekeeping. Um, just to remind everyone, the meeting is being recorded, um, which will go up onto the um, council website in due course. Um, just some other key um, sort of bits of housekeeping. Obviously, if you're not speaking, if you can mute your microphones if possible, just to obviously avoid any sort of reverberation or feedback. Um, also, um, if you get any problems in terms of internet connection, as we go through the meeting uh, one way you can get around that is if you turn your camera off um, it can speed up um, the audio side of things and the key thing is to hear and be heard for the meeting um, obviously we've got some got councillor parker who's dialed in as well so unfortunately he'll be, he'll be able to hear but unfortunately he won't be seen uh, during the meeting okay um i think that's the main points um i don't think there's anything else oh um only a quick thing um obviously if you want to speak um you can raise your hand obviously if you can't raise your hand your webcam's not available there's also the chat function as well which is on the control panel for the meeting you can send messages through to the chair or myself there also um if you can't do that you can sort of obviously interject where you can and, and asked if you want to speak okay right um if we're all happy i'll make a start with the agenda of the meeting um the first item on the agenda tonight is the appointment of the chairman um if members would like to put forward any nominations for the chair for tonight please i'd like to nominate sandra perks okay uh, Councillor Nugent. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to nominate Councillor Chris Okay. Uh, we also need seconders. Uh, I can see Councillor Rogers um, on his hand up. Second. Okay. Good yeah, I think it's me. I got pictures from that. Yeah, I, I'll oh, second um, the nomination. I'll for delete the... Somebody should okay. let me in, I think. Okay, bear with me a second. Right. The people who are not speaking, mute, please. Screen speaking. Sorry. Bear with us, everyone. I just want to make sure it's uh, all mute. Yeah, I can hear you, Mark, on my main screen, but. It I don't think uh, my pictures come up yet. If it's a okay. problem, I'll, I'll close the screen down and just use the telephone. No, Andrew, it's probably better on the screen, actually. Activate your camera, Andrew. 
Oh, I think that. All right. Thank That's you. Great. We can see you Thank now. You, okay. Okay. If everyone's happy, we'll. Um, we've obviously got seconders for the nominations. Um, I will go through the list of members, and then obviously we'll just go through what who your preference is. Okay. Okay, um, I'll go firstly for Councillor Aviat. Um, I, I nominate Councillor Sandra Perks. Yes, sorry. Um, next then, Councillor Bird. Perks. Um, Councillor Brooks. Sandra Perks, but can I just check that you could see me? Because twice I had my hand up and John called me in. So I just want to check, can you actually see me raising my hand? No, your camera's um, not activated. Uh, you need to activate your camera, Bronwyn. That's probably yes. right. That's it. That's it. Thank you, <laughs> okay. Councillor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Cave. Obviously, <laughs> you uh, Councillor Cave, yes, with my number. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, Councillor Collins. Uh, Councillor Perks. Okay. Right, um, Councillor Hanks. Uh, uh, Sandra Perks. Thank you. Councillor Nugent Finn. Councillor Christine Cave. Thank you very much. Councillor Parker. Uh, Sandra Perks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Perks. Let's see that nominate the preference. Sandra Perks. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Rowlands. Uh, Councillor Cave. Councillor Cave. Okay, uh, just obviously going through the preferences. Um, Sandra Perks has been um, duly elected as the chair. Thank you for electing me as chair. Um, if we move on to item number two of um, the agenda, appointment of vice chair, um, do you have any nominations for vice chair, please? Uh, Bronwyn's I'd like to nominate Councillor Julie Aviat. I'll second that. Here's a nomination. I'd like to nominate Councillor Kay. I'll second that. Move to. Can I make a point, Chair, that you're quite quiet? I can't hear you. Me? I can't hear anything. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Sandra, but it is very faint. Um, I wonder if somebody could turn the volume up on your microphone somehow. Is it using yeah. the, the, the your council tablet? No, I'm having to use my own. Can you hear using, me? Are you using an iPad or a uh, a laptop? I'll have to get that. Uh, Bear with you, me, council. I'll have a look now. You can turn the microphone settings up so it makes it louder. If you look on the on the um, on the all the boxes at the side there's there's the one with the mute in built in output there and then there's a way of turning that up somehow
Really poor, Sandra. We can't hear you. We're just going to uh, briefly uh, see if we can get the chair's volume up, if everyone can hold for a second, OK? Yeah. Thank you. It may be just a case of moving it closer to you. Okay, apologies for this. Does that make it any better? Can you hear me better now? Okay, I'll just set, I'll sit you left out of my face like this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, a little if, bit better. If we can go to press printed, um, and Mark will go through the councillors. Okay, uh, starting first with Councillor Aviat. Councillor Julie Aviat. Councillor Bird. Julie Aviat. Um, Councillor Brooks. Julie Aviat. Councillor Cave. Councillor Cave. Councillor Collins. Councillor Aviat. Right. Um, Councillor Hanks. Councillor Aviat. Councillor Nugent Finn. Councillor Christine Cave. Okay. Councillor Parker. Councillor Julie Aviat. Okay. Councillor Perks. Councillor Julie Aviat. Okay. And Councillor Rowlands. Uh, Councillor Kay. Right, okay. Um, just going through that. And Councillor Julie Avia is duly elected as Vice Chair. Okay, Councillor, uh, um, okay, Chair, um, we've got apologies from Mr. A. Raybould, Mrs. Winnie Davis, Mrs. Gina Doyle, and Mrs. Bethan Hunt um, from the Tenant Working Group, and Mrs. Bethan Hunt is from the uh, Citizens Advice representatives. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay. Oh, we're struggling with Sandra again, Mark. Give me a second. Do we want to go through the minutes of the meeting held on the 12th of February? Or do we uh, take the first round? Can anyone hear the last? No. Uh, no. Oh.
Does it make any difference with me without my headphones on? Yes, it's better. Okay, I've taken my headphones headphones off. Okay, do we the minutes? Sorry, apologies for this, guys. Um, so item number four: minutes of the meeting held on the twelfth of February. Do we want to take them as read, or do we want to go through them? Uh, any suggestions? As read. Councilor, as read. Okay, if everyone's happy with that, we'll take them as read. Um, as read. Any. Thank you. Any declaration? Item number five. Any declarations of interest um, from any of the members, please? Okay, thank you. Um, so now we can move on to item number six, the presentation, which I believe um, Miles is going to do. Um, it, it will have a split screen, so we'll have the presentation on the screen as well. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, good evening. This this presentation provides members with an update on the council's response to the COVID nineteen pandemic and our work towards recovery. Um, next month, you'll have a further presentation because the report is due to cabinet in September, which deals with our strategy. So, as I say, this will be a theme I think over the next few meetings. So. We'll provide a further presentation with more detail next month. So it, just a bit of an explanation, if anyone's ever been involved with disaster management, they'll be familiar with these terms. So essentially we treated COVID like any other disaster. Um, essentially your first point of call with a disaster is, a, is your initial response. The initial response deals with um, the uh, issue when it's at its peak. So in the case of uh, COVID, it was uh, around the March time. Then we move into tra to transition, which is essentially when Welsh Government is starting to release some of the controls on lockdown, and we are stepping up our services uh, back in to, to provide to the public, and then full recovery. In terms of recovery, um, normally in most emergencies, that's, that's back to normal. Um, but what we've established, um, and I think you probably recognise this as well, is that there's an opportunity for us to recover to better than normal, because some of the things that's happened over the period with COVID have been some interest in learning, um, some of the issues such as people working remotely um, and some of the things we brought in place like the HWRC site uh, booking arrangements which have been really successful. So recovery in terms of us is going to be um, a, a, a better provision of services that we would say rather than what was previously the case. We always have to be aware that we could revert back as well as you can go through these stages in a forward positive way you can always go backwards. Um, we've all seen what's happened in RCT today. Um, they have effectively, effectively gone back into response phase. So we are ready for that should that happen. So if, if there's a problem with the veil, we are able to go back into that response phase um, because we're basically well learned in it now. We, we'd rather not do that, but we can go back into that phase should it be necessary for us to do so. So in terms of the next slide, um, when the pandemic struck, we, we defined a number of quick response objectives. So we knew that we had to provide certain services and, and they, they couldn't stop. For, for example, caring for vulnerable residents, which is one of our main priorities, which is one of the things we had to ensure that we did. Um, mm -hmm. um, things that perhaps we didn't think at that time were that important in terms of um, the priority of services. And one, one of which is, is building cleaning. So one of the services that comes into this committee. Um, in our um, continuity plans for business, building cleaning was never really right up there as one of the most important services we provide. But in terms of a disaster like this, it certainly is up there. Um, and I must say, I must give thanks to the, the cleaning staff and the management because some of the work they did when this pandemic was at its peak, particularly working in the hubs, was exemplary. And I know we've, we've uh, gained some good reputation with the schools um, and we're hoping, Mike and I, that we'll actually get some more work in long and long term out of that. So we had to ensure that the lockdown measures were in place. So we were pretty quick in closing down things like parks and open spaces, some of our car parks. Um, and it was interesting to see Barry Island in April with not a soul on it. Um, and we took that action to protect our, our public, our residents and our visitors. Um, and we also had to make sure that our workforce was safe. 
so one of the things we were doing is changing the way we deliver our services. So you may have seen um, refuse collection services um, from March to, to June and July. We had a situation where we were following the refuse vehicle around with uh, a, a person in there, one of the loaders in a car. The reason for that is we couldn't have three vehicles, uh, three people in a cab at the same time. Um, we've, we've reverted away from that now and, and uh, the crews are wearing PPE. But that was our response, uh, maintaining the services, but also protecting our staff. One of the things we also did as well, which was very important to us, was our community leadership role. So we, we were one of the first councils to have the Tamo vehicles out there, basically spreading the message to stay safe, stay indoors. So that worked really well for us. And, and we had that going for about four weeks at the height of the, uh, the problem of the pandemic. We had to work closely with our partners, clearly. Um, and we had to keep the council running and help businesses. So we gave out uh, millions of pounds worth of grants really promptly. Um, and that was mostly in Marcus's area, but we helped a lot of businesses continue to operate during that really difficult time. Um, and we kept the council running. Um, a combination of staff working from home and working at the office. Um, and some of the things that we did, uh, it was really pleasing to see, in particular, people like the refuse crews getting really um, well praised by the public for continuing to deliver their services. And also, I, I will say this now because it's, I'm really proud of it, for the first quarter of this year, the height of the pandemic, we have a recycling performance target of 70%. So um, whilst other councils, and I won't name them, were not able to collect all their recycling and were even having to burn some of it because of the issues with their uh, workforce, we managed with our workforce to continue those frontline services in as, as normal as way as, as we could. And we also did our best to keep, to keep people informed at that time. So in, in terms of the next slide then, in terms of our decision making, um, this was challenging because as you know, the, the majority of the main decisions we make are made by yourselves um, and the, the meetings couldn't, couldn't sit. So we very quickly took a report to Cabinet at the end of March and explained the emergency decision processes that we would have to take during the pandemic. And those are all published on our website for the public and other members to see. And we consulted on them when we could but the issue in terms of leadership, if anyone knows much about the principles of leadership, it was very much a command and control structure at that time, dealing with the response and, and, and decisions had to be made really quickly. So they were well informed decisions, but we had to do them perhaps twice as quick as we normally would. And we used the emergency power procedure to do that. We, we hope we communicated regularly with elected members. You'll be the judge of that, uh, I'm sure. Um, and I know that we were certainly responsive as, as we could be to, to, to members during that time. And we had started off having virtual meetings. So this seemed quite normal now, but in March, it was the most oddest thing we've ever taken part in, I, I would suggest. But we're pretty good at it now. And I, I was really heartened to see the work that my colleagues did in um, Democratic for the AGM, because we managed to get all members online. Um, they all seemed to take an active role, and it, and it was pleasing to see that we could do that with with all 47 members and officers. As I say, we, we took the, um, the report to Cabinet in March. Um, we're now starting to have our meetings um, in, a, in a virtual way. In terms of our internal decision-making structure, we also set up um, what we term as a goal command structure. Um, and essentially, that again is in disaster management terms. That's where the majority of the decisions were assessed and taken um, before the emergency powers were actually asked for. Um, and that used to meet, at the height of the pandemic, used to meet daily. Um, uh, every day we would meet and we'd, we would discuss exactly what we needed to do that day and, and, and the following day. And we'd meet uh, daily throughout the week. And we would also meet on weekends at the height of the pandemic. And that was essentially the, the corporate management team um, with latterly the leader and the deputy leader. Um, but we took our decisions then um, and guidance from um, leader and deputy. And then we would put in emergency powers following that. So. I think our decisions, um, and you might say I'm bound to say this, um, were, were made promptly uh, and were made properly. Um, and some of the things we did um, and some of the things we, we opened, um, for example, public conveniences, we closed them, but we opened them before anybody else. And we opened them because we'd undertaken a proper risk assessment, which we ended up giving to the Welsh Local Government Association so they could give to others. So some of the things we did during this pandemic, it wasn't all brilliant. You know, there were some learning points. But a lot of the things that we did were, were, were quickly made decisions, the right decisions, and, and we were followed by others in, in, in those decisions. So on to the next slide. Uh, 
In the summer, we, we had a reflective learning exercise with senior staff across uh, the, the full organisation um, to identify things we did well and things that perhaps uh, hadn't worked so well. And we posed ourselves a series of questions, and these are the questions there. Um, a few things come out of that discussion, um, which we'll go on to in a minute, which is issues in terms of staff morale working from home. So we did a piece of work on that to make sure our staff were safe, because one of the issues you've got with staff working remotely is, is you worry about their well-being because you, you don't see them. So um, that's a big piece of work we did. We've also done work on the, the impact of COVID on, on the community we serve. So what I'd like to do now, I've, I've got a, um, my colleague Mike is here. So what I, what I thought would be more interesting to you than the theory is Mike taking you through some of the headlines for his service area um, to see how housing has been affected by COVID and, and what he's done and his team has done in order to mitigate and, and to and to take those, uh, those those services forward, particularly when Mike's service deals with the most vulnerable, and in situations like this, is the most vulnerable or the worst affected. So, if I can just uh, allow Mike's slides to come up and give Mike uh, a few minutes to present his, and then we'll come back to this presentation if if members are happy. Yes, everyone's happy with Mike presenting now. Yes. Excellent. Okay, um, I'm not sure which order these are, these are going to come up, but the first, the first one obviously is building services. And one, one of the issues um, primarily that we had is obviously we needed to follow the legislation and the guidance that was passed at, uh, during, during lockdown. And as members will probably aware, other than essential or emergency works, um, there, there was very little uh, 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 work for us to carry out. The result of that was that um, a couple of things that we did to try and stop transmission around the workplace. We allowed the workforce to take the works vans homes, home, whereas previously they'd been required to, to, to come up to the Alps to pick their vans up to then go to work. So that was one of the first things we did about sort of reducing possibility of transmission. Emergency works continued, so our emergency gas and electrical works, they, they continued. Um, we continued to work on voids because the legislation also allowed us to uh, let or to allocate properties in response to the crisis. Um, now, obviously, as you'll see from one of the later slides, one of the issues that, that we have had is the huge increase in, in um, uh, rehousing requirements um, at the outset and have continued probably over the last five, five, six months, although have plateaued probably over the last month or so as we sort of move forward uh, through the pandemic. Um, so we continue to work on our voids. Um, our stores were integral in providing uh, a response to um, that, that service across the council for schools and, and, and other establishments and, co and coordination of PPE products for the, the offices and, and, and uh, other buildings. We also continued with public compliance, public buildings compliance where we could. Clearly a lot of the buildings that we would actually be going to visit to check on things like their gas certification, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we couldn't get into those buildings, um, but subsequently we have picked up on all those works and all the buildings that, that are currently open, all the critical compliance checks were completed. One of the things we obviously uh, hadn't done in the main um, previously was to test for Legionnaire's disease because obviously most of our schools are open most of the time. However, where they were shut for months on end, the schools were required obviously to undertake Le Legionnaire's testing because they, the, the water was standing in, in, in pipes for, for months and months and months. Um, so building clean and security have, have subsequently we were also, as we moved out of lockdown and where we were able to do essential and other repair and responsive works, uh, the workforce has come back. We split the shift, so we had workforce in because there wasn't enough work for them all to do. We had, because tenants clearly at that stage didn't want people within their properties carrying out repairs to their kitchen units or uh, um, you know, some of the more routine repairs that we do. Um, that has moved on and we're probably at about 80%, I suppose, of where we would have expected to be at this time last year, as, as, as an example. 
one of the impacts for building services, as members will, will be aware, building services is, is a DLO, a direct labour organisation, and it's based on the principle of trading account. And one of the difficulties we will have towards the end of the year, there's a requirement clearly for that trading, trading account to operate, um, uh, not necessarily profitably, but certainly not to lose money. Um, one of the issues that we have is obviously a lot of our clients didn't want work done for the six month period. We have started to pick up. We had a backlog of work that, that we're obviously starting to work through as well, which has led to some complaints from, from customers uh, and tenants with regard to some delays in terms of getting some of the non-essential work now carried out. Um, but nevertheless, there will be a pressure on the building services account, the, the, the trading account at the end of the year. And I would imagine we, we, we will make a loss on the trading account this, this year. We just won't be able to pick up all of the work that we've missed. Um, in saying that, our project and plan team throughout the summer has done all of the work that they were required to do in our schools as part of the school's capital programme. Um, and that was carried out in a very short period, constrained period of, of time. Um, next slide, please. We obviously had a huge impact on community safety issues uh, right throughout, and we continue to have some of those issues moving forward, but fortunately not so many. As you can see from the slide, antisocial behaviour for the period between April and August saw a 166% increase in reported antisocial behaviour, um, 2,622 incidents. Um, the team, uh, were more than stretched, I think it's fair to say. Uh, they didn't break, um, but um, it was extremely challenging for the community safety team to be able to respond uh, to all of the issues that all appeared to be happening at the same time. Clearly, we had the issues of, of neighbours unhappy with uh, other neighbours breaching lockdown conditions, um, but also issues uh, in relation to general ASB around barbecues noise, dogs, children, that came as a result of vast, the vast majority of the population being in their homes 24 hours a day, um, and, and obviously those tensions that, that existed. As we indicate there, we had a lot of issues with younger people and, and, and some of the other issues which are going to have a longer term impact and we're still working through. One of the things that we did do as a result of a number of the issues that we saw early on that were reported quite widely, I suppose, in the media and, um, and obviously yourselves as members, was around um, a, a lack of response to the hotspots that, that were occurring. Uh, we couldn't be everywhere, nor could the police could be everywhere all of the time. And as a result of which, the council took the decision to purchase five deployable cameras which we've now purchased and the majority of them are now on site, which are dealing with the hotspot issues. So where we've, we've had an issue at say Maslin Park, uh, we had issues obviously at Ogmore, which were, which were well uh, um, publicized um, and other areas, we now have the ability to deploy these cameras. Now members may be aware that probably a year 18 months ago, we were talking around the use or the value of CCTV in the Vale that the council operates um, um, uh, and, and pays for on its own. No other partner contributes to the cost of the Vale managed CCTV system. Um, and we were seeing at that time very little requirement for CCTV going forward. We were paying an awful lot of money, but it wasn't identifying a lot of crime. Um, however, um, what we've seen over the last few months in terms of dealing with, as I say, these hotspot issues, the value of CCTV, both in terms of detecting crime, but I suppose in also, you know, often people say, well, you're just moving the problem somewhere else. And that does happen. You know, people move from Maslin Park and they went to Romley Park. Um, so that does happen. Um, but however, you know, the CCTV is, is state of the art. Uh, we are able obviously to identify individuals and both ourselves and the police can obviously deal with individuals um, that we, we've identified uh, more easily. Uh, there will be a report going to cabinet in the next few weeks, 
with regard to the review of CCTV with a number of options um, around future funding um, and also uh, in relation to whether uh, there's an all Wales response to CCTV or a regional response. Um, I will be sitting on a strategic CCTV group which has been set up and Deb Gibbs will sit on the operational arm of that group and we will report back to, see, uh, to, to Cabinet in due course. Domestic abuse, um, I think we were extremely concerned that there would be a huge increase in reported cases. Um, as you can see, the community safety team uh, identified that reported cases remained relatively stable in comparison to last year's reports. Um, but we were still responding quickly to, to those reports as they came in, both on a multi-agency basis uh, with partners. Um, I think what we will probably not see yet is a number of cases that will come to the fore in, in the coming months. Um, because as we all know, domestic abuse is obviously a hidden issue. Uh, and as uh, particularly uh, victims are able to contact agencies face to face or through other means the likelihood is that reporting will increase clearly it's been very difficult for a, uh, somebody that is being abused to report at the moment although there are avenues to, to be able to do so but those opportunities are less but will improve as, as we move forward next slide please And finally, I suppose where the majority of our work has been actually carried out over the last six months, uh, it's been an enormous challenge and continues to be so. Um, I've mentioned um, the, the, the housing solutions and allocation side, we continue to let properties throughout the pandemic, but the impact on our homelessness and our housing support and supporting housing service has been immense. Um, during the period uh, from March uh, to date, we've dealt with over 230 uh, cases that we wouldn't have previously had a rehousing responsibility for. Uh, how have we done that? Um, we entered into legal agreements with three hotels in the Vale of Morgan. Uh, clearly, they weren't accepting uh, clients at that stage. Um, and we continue, we, as I say, we have 76 rooms in those three establishments as of today. I think 69 of them are occupied. Um, but over the period of time, we've moved people out of that, that accommodation and into alternative temporary accommodation. But the challenge we'll have is, is going forward. Welsh Government have announced on Friday that the funding under Phase 1, which funds the bed and breakfast provision that we have, will continue to the end of March, uh, based on the £10 million that Welsh Government set aside at the beginning of the pandemic. They also set aside £50 million, both in terms of revenue and capital, for what they call the Phase 2 response. The Phase 2 response is for local authorities to obviously then be able to unpick um, the log jam that is now caused. We, we have, as I say, lots of people in bed and breakfast. We have nowhere to move them to at the moment, um, or very few options to move those people to. So the phase two, um, we were required to put forward a, a response to Welsh Government. Each, each local authority in Wales did that to bid for um, the 50 million, uh, a portion of the 50 million pounds. We put forward about five or six projects we were only successful in two. Uh, one is uh, looking to develop a modular housing scheme, so an off-site construction to provide um, up to 14 modular units of accommodation, um, and we're working on that now. Um, £50 million, pounds, by the way, has to be spent by the end of March. Um, so it doesn't give us much time or local authorities very much time to actually spend that money and put provision in place. One of the other schemes we're looking at is a complex needs scheme because what we've found is a lot of the people that have come through the system that we wouldn't otherwise have identified as vulnerable 
or those that we have identified as vulnerable, a, a large number of them we've seen before. We've seen them before four or five times. And what this has given us an opportunity, and it's a positive opportunity, is that we've actually accommodated people and we've had the opportunity because they've been um, uh, located in secure accommodation, we've been able to work with them. So we've been working really closely with drug and alcohol agencies, mental health agencies, health, social services, and providing wraparound support solutions for these people, which will obviously assist us in the long term and hopefully break this cycle that we have seen with very many uh, of uh, particularly the young single people that, that, that we've had to deal with in the past. One of the, I, I, I suppose, disappointments is that we've in, we invested an awful lot of our supporting people fund in the opening of a one-stop shop in Holton Road, uh, which was to provide um, um, services um, directly to people who, who, who just walked in off the street. Now, uh, they were due to open on April the 6th. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't due able to open and they've still not opened to face-to-face -face meetings. They are working uh, virtually with all of our clients and provide support and um, uh, assessment and support for all of our clients. Um, but we are seeing those that we have safeguarding duties or concerns about and for those that are very, very vulnerable. They are being seen in a COVID, in, in, in a secure way, in a safe way, face-to-face. But the vast majority of the people we're supporting at the moment is is virtually. The civic offices will open in the next few weeks to housing services. At the moment, it's uh, we're not uh, receiving housing clients at the civic, um, but that service will will open shortly as we understand the learning from um, the the measured opening that we've had recently. Um, I think that that's about it. I think the problem, as I say, the challenge we will have going forward is how are we going to assist effectively 230 people, uh, not necessarily just those in bed and breakfast, but 230 people, the majority of which are single people or couples, uh, into permanent accommodation um, in the future. About 50% of those people are people that we might not have had any statutory duty for in the past, but obviously whilst government have amended the legislation, whether it be temporarily or permanently, um, so that we do now have a duty for those people. But clearly, we don't have the move on solution for them all uh, as quickly, and certainly the phase two response will not assist everyone. We're clearly going to have to be relying on our RSL partners in terms of some of their development programs going forward, our own development program. But we're talking about medium and long term issues. And I suppose our concern is in the interim, in the absence of those, what's going to happen with the people in the temporary accommodation? You know, it's supposed to be emergency accommodation. Certainly bed and breakfast is not what we would see as suitable accommodation for, for residents in the long term. And I suppose that's where we will be working as a team over the next uh, three or four months, and putting forward some other solutions. We may have to look at de-designating existing council stock. Um, we may obviously be lobbying Welsh government um, with regard to issues around, and even though it's not a devolved issue, things around um, uh, discretionary housing payments, issues around the welfare reform, uh, issues around um, um, bedroom tax and, and and those sorts of things because you know as we know uh, people under 35 generally are only entitled to the shared room allowance uh, and we haven't got a great deal of shared rooms in the Vale um, so there are a number of issues we're gonna we're gonna look at I know Mar said I would talk through quickly obviously that wasn't very quickly but I haven't seen you all for such a long time and I thought uh, I thought you might be interested in, in where we've been for the last six months. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mike, for that uh, that very interesting uh, presentation. If um, people are happy, if we can come back to questions that we might have for Mike after Miles finishes his presentation, is that okay with everybody? Yeah. So if you've got any questions, note them down, and we'll come back after uh, Miles has finished his. Okay.
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mike. Chair, Chair, I wonder if this would be an opportunity to bring in my colleague, uh, Marcus Goldsworthy, because one of the issues that's covered by this committee is disabled facility grants. So whether Marcus could provide an update on, on the issues in his area, if you would be happy for Marcus to do that? Yes, yes, we'll, we'll hear from Marcus as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'll be really quick. And, and actually, a lot of the issues that, that Mike has raised are, are exa exactly the same. They're re exactly relevant because um, obviously during the initial lockdown, um, we rely on referrals from uh, the council's occupational therapists, um, both in social services and in, in other areas with regard to disabled facilities grants. And of course, those just dried up because um, the uh, obviously no one wanted to, to go and meet occupational therapists and um, uh, and, and occupational therapists were not going out to meet uh, people either. Um, the other issue we came across was we use a number of builders to undertake these works and the builders immediately put staff on furlough so we had no one actually to undertake any of the works. Um, so what has happened over that period is that we have had um, a real slowdown or almost, almost a stop in terms of um, work uh, for disabled facilities grants itself, although the staff have been repurposed and were um, involved in uh, grant issuing grants to um, businesses and indeed also in appropriating PPE uh, and um, being able to um, uh, obtain stock for the council. Um, as time has moved on, obviously, as Mike has said, with regard to his housing teams, um, work has started again. Um, and we uh, started initially with some of the lower risk adaptations, including stair lifts and um, multi room adaptations. Um, we have obviously got, still got issues because quite a lot of the clients that we work with were shielding. So um, they weren't really willing to have builders in the house doing any work. Um, but uh, we have managed to overcome some of those issues. Um, and finally, one important point, we have been trying to get a pre-contract um, uh, or a contract framework in place with a number of builders working in the Vale of Morgan so that we can get on site quickly and get projects commenced quickly. Um, that has now been uh, completed and we are hoping to get um, uh, at about 20 orders out to the builders in the in with, now with contained within the scheme quickly um, and uh, those projects will start hopefully rel relatively soon um, one point to make which i know mike has made is that obviously there's been a huge pent-up demand as as, uh, as occurred during the time when um the uh, the uh, actions of the disabled services team couldn't be undertaken. Um, so we are now trying to work through that demand. But actually, again, like Mike, our services are self-funding. And it's clear that this year, there's no way we can get to a point where the disabled facilities team will be able to fund itself on the amount of work they've been able to get through. So we will be looking at a deficit during that period. But um, yeah, that was that. that's it really. Very quick one done. Thank you very much all. Thank you, Marcus. Um, again, if we have any um, questions for Marcus, if we just save them to the end once uh, Miles has finished his as well. OK, thank you. OK, thank you, Chair. Can everybody hear me again? Yeah. OK, cheers. OK, we're not back to the presentation. Uh, essentially, one of the things we wanted to do in terms of the recovery is take our staff with us. This is uh, it sounds a bit uh, obvious, but staff are as worried as anyone else in terms of the pandemic and, and, and we wanted them in some cases to continue their work as they've done before so what we wanted to do was to basically get in amongst them and have a word with them and, and ask them a series of questions and what you see there is the headings of the questions we asked them um, and what follows i will follow through these rather quickly there's quite a few slides here but we asked our staff to respond to, to these questions around these headings um, and there's the, the first slide if we can just go on one please we had we had quite a few responses, over a thousand responses. Um, a lot of the responses at that time were, were working from home, which which is who we wanted to capture. Really, we were really worried about people being isolated, and also people being at home working where perhaps they didn't have the facilities that uh, they would have in the office. And one of the issues I think we we don't um, often give enough credit to is that is the social aspects of working in an office environment and the connections between staff uh, and the and the relationships formed. So. We're quite quite pleased to see that um, not everyone had a problem working with home. In, in fact, the majority of people would like to have this home and work work in balance, which is quite interesting for us. So that that's that's the first slide that, that showed that generally people were reasonably happy 
um, with working from, from home. Um, now, what we, the next two slides there show about were they worried about the coronavirus personally? Um, our figures are roughly what the, the um, Office of National Statistics average was. So there, there were staff who were worried, they're, they're no doubt still worried, uh, and we're doing what we can to reassure them. Um, and we're certainly making sure that they got the correct PP and these sort of things. Um, and, and the managers are very accessible um, should they have any issues about their own, their own safety. So moving on to the next slide. Um, so in terms of health and well-being, uh, th this slide shows a series of questions relating to the health and well-being and, and gathering information, understanding the steps being taken and the extent to which our staff feel the council care about them. Um, and the results are generally positive. Um, and I'm really, really pleased that that's the case. Um, and in terms of senior leaders, people like myself, they were significant interest in the decisions that we were making um, and, and that we were visible. Um, I know that I, I, in my role, I, I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and, and to have quite a large office space where I can isolate myself. Um, but just the very fact of the refuge crew seeing managers in um, shows to them that the problem is shared. And I think it's important for us as managers to, to be visible. And I know Mike has done the same. And most of us are splitting our time between home and the workplace, obviously keeping ourselves safe. But it's important that we're there for the staff because a lot of the frontline staff have not had any opportunity to work from home. Uh, and often there's a feeling that people from working from work, people working from home are not working uh, in their eyes because that's not an opportunity that's open to them. So I, I think the very fact that the managers were were turning up the Alps at normal time um, and seeing the crews going in and coming out was, was hopefully something that, that gave them a bit, of, a bit of a lift. So if we go to the next slide. Communications is always something that we struggle with, particularly with our frontline staff, because they don't have um, all the IT kits uh, generally. So we, we've been regularly sending out messages. The, the MD has been sending out a, a weekly message thanking groups of staff. We also, I think you've seen, we, we put signs up on roundabouts, giving some thank you messages to care workers and, and some of the key workers that have been working hard through, through the uh, pandemic. And it, it was really well received. I, I have to say that the biggest lift that the staff got was from the public themselves. Um, and the refuse crews, some of the, some of the vehicles were, were adorned with posters and stickers and crayon drawings and you name it, they, they had them up because the public were really appreciative of the work they were doing. Um, sickness levels in that service area fell like a stone during that time, um, and it, which is a message for managers. I'm firmly of the belief that the reason that sickness levels dropped was because of the values of the staff thought they were, they were valued more than they were previously. And they were, they were very proud to come to work um, because they, they were being recognized for what they did. So that's a lesson for managers, I think, to, to try and engender that as, as, we, go, as we go forward. So the next slide then, um, response to questions relating to line management, support were highly positive. 90% um, of respondents feel interested uh, to do their jobs, which is really important for us. And 83% feeling their manager cares for their health and well-being. Well, I, I'd be worried if, if that wasn't the case. So um, work is still being progressed in, in, in uh, terms of working arrangements and flexibility. We know now that we're not going to go back to everyone being in the office, whatever happens, because it's not the most efficient use of their time or hours or office space. What we're doing now is we're trying to get the balance right between people working in the office when they need to be and then working remotely when they, when they don't need to be in the office. And we hope by doing this, we'll not only improve our services, we'll improve the staff well-being, but we'll also free off some office space. So give ourselves um, if you like, more income that we can spend on our services. So the findings that the service be, are being analysed and provided to the heads of service, because we, we did this by service area as well, because it's not always the same and, and different services work in different ways. Um, and the work then to deal with staff welfare has been progressed through the organisational development team and the, and the directorate uh, teams. So the, the next slide then um, deals with transition. Um, so this is where we are, I suppose, at the minute. We're moving out of full lockdown. We could be moving back in, um, but certainly we're, we're, we're not where we were in March or April. And the next slide details the transition phase. Um, and these are the sort of headings. The ones in bold there were the sort of things we had to do as we're coming out of transition. So we still have lots of risks. 
so we have to manage or, or mitigate them. Um, we cannot get um, blasé in any way with our staff. Um, and just recently, we've introduced the wearing of face masks in all our communal areas, corridors, toilets, kitchen facilities. Um, and there's very few people in our buildings, um, but we have chosen that as a method of making sure that our staff stay safe. Um, and as the staff have been communicated with and understand why we're asking that, and everyone, um, certainly in, in the Alps that I've seen, is following that, uh, that procedure. In terms of transition, it's a less pressured period of time because you don't have to have this command and control structure as such. You do have to make the correct decisions. And what's important, I think, for us is not going back to the way we always did things, just because we always did it that way. There has been some really good learning. There has been some teams that we've seen that can operate with less staff. There have been some teams that need more staff. There have been issues where the public have helped themselves, where previously we provided those services for them, and they're quite happy to help themselves. So it's about learning from that process within this transition. So as we go into recovery, we end up with a set of services that are better than they were before. So we'll move on to the next slide. Um, what we've done in order to deliver this, sorry, the management transition, that's the one, yeah. So we've set a directory recovery team. So I've got my own management team and we're working through the, the transition. And we've also got a series of corporate teams where we look at cross-cutting themes. So um, it might, it might sound a bit boring, but all this is linked to the corporate plan. So you'll, you, you'll see now the themes in respect of the new corporate plan are linked into what we're doing in terms of transition and recovery. So we go on to the next slide which is the next slide's recovery update. So as we go through transition, we're always looking at uh, our end position, because that's what we're aiming to, aiming to do. Um, in terms of the principles of recovery, as I said before, it's not just about a previous state for services. We're um, having a public consultation exercise now on things like household waste recycling centres. Do, do the public want us to continue with a booking arrangement? There's been some excellent learning in the housing department in terms of our support to tenants. Um, we're moving more down the um, digital route, which uh, saves us resources in terms of staffing, which gives more money and able to provide services. Um, and we're fundamentally rethinking some of the services we do. Also looking at opportunities, because there are, in every disaster, in every downsize or, or, or risk of, of, of arrangement, there, there will be opportunities. So we're looking at them as part of the uh, recovery principle. So on the next slide, um, We've got some high-level themes that we're looking at recovery under, and you'll recognise these headings. Um, and we've drawn on the reflective learning we've had from the staff sessions we had in the summer. Um, and we're using the, the five ways of working. So if we ever audited in terms of how we're going through these headings, we can show the auditors and Welsh Government that we're actually using the um, Wellbeing and Future Generations Act to guide us through the, these, these principles. So on to the next slide. These four headings uh, are the four headings in green there. They're from the new corporate plan. Um, and essentially what we've done, we've dropped the themes from the previous slide under three of the headings. So the three that go over to the right, um, because what we've said is working with, with and for our communities is an un underpinning um, objective. So all of this work will not happen unless we work with our communities. So this is how we're linking essentially the recovery work we're doing to the corporate plan. Okay, and we'll move on. So, as I said previously, it's a bit of a fancy slide here, but we are reporting the coronavirus uh, strategy to Cabinet on the 21st of S September. Um, the strategy will show for, for each objective a reminder of what we want to achieve about that objective, uh, the relevant recovery themes that link with the objective, um, and the threats and opportunities associated with each, and a strategy to basically take us through that. Um, and this strategy, if agreed by Cabinet and yourselves, will be used by us um, in order to take us through now to the next phase where hopefully we're a better organisation than we were at the start. So, on to the next slide. So, TMT Gold continues. As I said, it was weekly. It's now once a week, but it can be ramped up very, very quickly. Um, the report is going to Cabinet in September in terms of the strategy, and it'll come back to yourselves. We are now, as directors, producing our own recovery plan, so everything we're doing is being recorded until um, we get to a better place rather than the place we were at previously. Uh, and the annual delivery plan, which I'll go on to in the next um, presentation, will encapsulate all the recovery factors and actions. 
So that's the end of the presentation. I'm not really sure the, the significance of the, the, the childlike writing on the front and last page, but um, I'm sure it means something to somebody. So um, I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. OK, thank you. Um, OK, so if um, people could raise their hands if they've got a question. I've got Bromin Brooks, Jonathan Byrne and Christine Cave at the moment. So if you go with Bromin first and then Jonathan and then Christine. OK, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I th and thank you, Miles, uh, Marcus and Mike. Uh, it's all the LEMs, isn't it? Um, for the presentation, I thought it was really, really interesting. And I think it's interesting to see where we've come from back in March to where we are now and actually starting to look forward. And I think around that recognition that, that it, I don't think our lives will ever actually be the same as they were before. Um, in some ways better, and in some ways, who knows? Who knows how, how this is all going to pan out? Um, I mean, I never thought I'd see anything like the situation in my lifetime. I've been uh, you know, around a few years now. Um, just a couple of questions, and maybe it's too soon to know these impacts yet. Obviously, you mentioned, Mike, you mentioned about the loss on the housing uh, trading account, and uh, Marcus, you did as well about the DFGs. If, if, if there's any thoughts really about how that's going to impact obviously next year's budgets, particularly as this is such an unstable situation at the moment, um, and also around the, the, the homelessness issue as well, um, it, it's, it's not going to go away, I don't think, anytime soon. And it's how we're going to deal with that and be prepared for either the next wave, mm -hmm. local lockdown, whatever actually happens because i don't think we can actually look too far into the future at the moment um and then there's another question it's just a thought around obviously enhanced cleaning is a priority washing hands uh, surfaces is an absolute priority to keep keep a lid on on covid um and i just wonder what, what sort of investigations or thoughts have taken place around different types of cleaning now for instance, I mean, I work in a hospital now, but I, you know, for instance, there they're just looking at investing in these new machines. They're called these machines, and they're actually portable. And it's like a literally like a porter pack. It's like something out of Ghostbusters, and they can go into a room, and it's it's like a vapor which cleans everything, and it, you can use it on fabric, on hard surfaces, on everything. And basically, that room then is dry in 20 minutes and completely clean and, and clear. So it, it's something, as I said, and the beauty of these machines, they're not, they're not cheap. The ones we're looking at are around £900 each, but they are mobile. And it's whether it's something that maybe you've looked into about using, because you can mobile, because you can actually move around places, into schools, into housing, into public areas. You can take it wherever you are. Um, so really, just any any thoughts around that as well? So that's it for a minute, Chair. Okay, Chair. Shall I, I'm, I'm happy to um, to offer the questions firstly to I'm not hospital passing these to, to Mike initially, and you know, I'll I'll pick up on them. So I know I know he's been working on the treatment account, and I know he's been talking to me about the types of cleaning and these 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 fogging machines. So if, if I if you don't mind, if I could ask Mike to respond first, and I'll fill in the get the gaps if there are any. Yes, yes, yeah. I'm happy for Mike to um, answer the start bit and then you can fill in any gaps, yes. Yeah, so, so um, Chair, in, in, uh, Councillor Brooks, in, in terms of the trading accounts, uh, it's a bit early for me to know exactly where the shortfall is going to be and how much that is, is going to be. As I say, we're, we're running through a backlog and hopefully we will pick up uh, a, a fair amount of that position um, by the end of the year. We, we are discussing clearly with Caris um, the potential in terms of uh, plugging some of those gaps. Um, and clearly, in terms of building services, the majority of clients are internal clients. Um, so one of the issues, we have SLAs in place, and obviously uh, we'll be looking to some of our clients to see what work they obviously would want us to do over the coming months. Uh, obviously, the biggest client for building services is housing um, and at the moment we obviously allocate an amount of money for repairs every year and some of the discussion we're having is around you know, how do we support that internal DLO um, to ensure that they are 
trading profitably next year. You, you can run a trading account at a loss, but you obviously have to have plans to make up uh, that difference. But one of the unfortunate things was, unlike some of the private businesses and some of the other, the other works, uh, you couldn't claim uh, the losses back, um, you know, as some of the other sections and departments have been able to do with the, um, you know, large amount of money that Welsh Government were making available to local authorities in terms of loss of income and, and what have you, because they are generally funded by public money anyway, you know, because of the internal nature of the service. So that, that, that's that been a challenge uh, and clearly we didn't have the option of furlough either. So all of the staff continued to be paid whether they were able to work or not. Um, so again, it's a challenging position. Um, I think we understand that financially how Karis is going to um, circle uh, or, uh, to, 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 to circle that square, I'm not sure at this stage. But as I say, as we come through uh, February and we're looking at our budgets then going forward next year's budgets those are the conversations we'll be having with Karen. It's interesting you mentioned um, with regard to cleaning uh, we have two of those types of machines we have a, a more static machine that you can roll into a large um, uh, room leave it there switch it on and it, it sits there we also have the uh, mobile device which as you say you strap on onto the back and you walk around the uh, in, in say a smaller classroom or in areas which are more difficult or you need more of a, a direct spray the only thing i say for our cleaners it's it's twice the work because once it does kill the virus it doesn't clean the classroom so um there we're obviously cleaning first we're using uh, viricidal products um, and we would tend to use the machines, the spraying and the fogging machine, in the event of a, a, of a, 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 a breakout. So where we knew, for example, there may be um, it needed a deep clean, where otherwise the room may have been not been able to be used for, say, 72 hours or whatever the case may be. So where there's, there's been an outbreak, um, we, would, we would look to use, use it in that way. But touch wood um, our cleaning staff have been fantastic through the six months they've worked all of them have worked um, even to the point you know with the hubs we obviously they were very very flexible because a lot of the people are contracted they contracted for certain hours and at certain locations they were extremely flexible um, they were very appreciative of the council's response to them specifically as a as, as a group um, and the uplift that they received for, for uh, a period of time. Very, very appreciative of that. And it, certainly in the early days when everyone else was at home and, and they were out working, you know, um, as, as many of us were. So, we, yes, we do have those machines. Um, Miles mentioned business opportunities. Um, Building Cleaning is a trading, uh, one of my trading account businesses as well. And um, it's fair to say that some of our private sector competitors haven't been doing perhaps so well as we have and haven't been as flexible as we have, both in terms of staff and also charging for lots of things that weren't in the original contracts. Um, we've taken a much more pragmatic approach. Uh, we're not charging schools more for our services, even though uh, it, it, that may have some impact. But we're talking to a number of schools who we've lost over the years who would like to have, uh, like, like for us to come in and give them some advice. Let's put it that way. I think you did have another question. Uh, I think it was about homelessness and about the long term impact. Um, I think I mentioned in, in the presentation that we're, we're in the here and now at the moment. We're dealing with the issues that we have. Uh, so, for example, one of the hotels uh, we're currently using um, is, is near to Roos Airport. Um, during um, the last month, clearly the airport uh, uh, have been the airport hotel have been taking on additional clients uh, who were flying out of of, of Cardiff Airport, um, and that did cause some tensions and some issues because some of our clients have have presented some challenges. We have dealt with those and we've dealt those really well with the airports um, 
uh, and we've had no major issues as may have been seen in other areas of Wales but they are some, some of those issues are being challenged. I think the issue that we have is that we don't have one bedroom stock in the Vale in, in, you know, in large quantities. Um, we obviously through our development, our own development program, our 106 uh, program, our um, uh, RSL program, we're committed to building more one bedroom accommodation, but that will take some time. Um, but come March, if the tap was turned off in March and the ten million pounds ran out and no more money was available, we would still have the obligation to keep the people in emergency accommodation. Um, and we might have some financial issues. Some of the members, long-standing members, may remember when we used B and B as a as a normal emergency accommodation. And we were nearly at the point where we're nearly some million pounds on bed and breakfast spend annually. Um, so we don't want to be there. Uh, and clearly we're in a far better position now with our own build program going forward. But yeah, it is going to be a challenge. And as say, other things we're going to have to think about, like de-designating our own stock, perhaps converting a lot more of our stock into smaller units, which is not as easy as it sounds. Um, but yeah, some 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 other some other uh, issues. We're working with the private sector as well. Uh, private sector's members will be aware provide an awful lot of our shared accommodation for for single people, and we are working with a number of landlords at the moment who are out there looking for opportunities for us. So um, that's looking extremely positive. Um, we're talking to one particular landlord about a, a former. Uh, residential home which is currently empty and the potential of converting that using the capital fund phase two funding and to turn that into some form of supported housing um, we're not dumping single people in accommodation and leaving the management to themselves we are going to be providing for the more complex cases supported accommodation and that will have some revenue implications for me but we'll meet that through our supporting people budget okay Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm off. I'm, I'm not on mute anyway. Um, and it was probably my fault causing uh, some feedback as well. But if uh, anybody who isn't speaking, if they can just make sure that they're on mute as well, because I think we're causing feedback there. Um, so I think the next person who wants to ask a question is Jonathan Bird, and then it's Councillor Christine Cave then as well. And then if I Rachel Nugent Finn is after after that have i missed anybody else off no okay so um uh, councillor uh, bird if you'd like to go next thank you um christine you are still not on mute um can you put yours on mute because it does cause feedback please um mike i'm very interested to hear about the 14 modular homes as a possibility of um could we have a little bit more detail what are they you know are they a bed sit type thing uh, and do you have a site in mind for them? And do we know what they're costing per unit or likely to cost per unit? Yes, we do. We we are looking at a site at the moment. It's in council ownership. It's in Barry. Um, we will be taking a report to cabinet shortly with regard to the phase two um, bid that we made. Um, we had emergency powers approval through. Uh, the council during the pandemic to make the bid which we did um, so there will be a formal report coming shortly as I say there were two schemes 14 units um, Welsh Government um, in terms of the capital side and in terms of the new build um, put, put uh, a lot of, a lot of emphasis on modern methods of construction uh, in, in terms of what they would support and clearly because of the time scales we're talking about these things have to be built and on site by the end of March. One of the advantages for us is obviously there's emergency planning legislation in place at the moment, which means that they wouldn't need a full planning application. Um, but obviously we would notify plan, planning committee of, of the use of, of that power. Um, they will require a full planning application, however, if they're going to be in situ for more than 12 months, um, in which case a full planning application would be made in due course if, if that was the case. Um, in terms of the site, it's a central Barry site. It's um, Court Road. 
um, court road site, um, the empty civic community site at the moment. There are initial, uh, there have been a lot of uh, initial appraisal work done. Um, and at the moment, we're awaiting final approval from Welsh Government to proceed. Uh, in terms of um, how much, um, we've estimated, well, certainly in terms of speaking to those that are manufacturing MMC at the moment, um, it, it's going to be around about a million pounds. Um, I think the problem that we have is that MMC, there are issues around supply chains. There aren't that many manufacturers in the country of MMC because um, local authorities generally are using traditional methods of construction. Um, but as I say, in terms of the carbon uh, zero agenda and the work that Welsh governments and local authorities are doing to reduce their carbon footprint, I think MMC will become certainly uh, a method that we will be using going forward and we'll see it within our own development programme uh, a lot more. So. Yeah, it works out. Uh, I can't remember the exact figure off off the top of my head, but it, it's it's what's that? Eighty? Is it eighty something? 70, Seventy thousand. The the units we've looked at are a mix of um, one person and two person units. Um, they are based on the uh, specification, as I say, set out by Welsh government in terms of space standards and amenities. They are uh, self contained. Uh, they have outside space as well as obviously the inside space. Um, the beauty of these is that whilst they will have a small electric heater within the units, it's it's not passive house, but it's very similar to a system called passive house, which members may have seen or be aware of. Um, it's a very, very similar system. Um, heating would probably only be needed if at all, uh, you know, uh, for, for, for an hour, perhaps a day, if that, just to warm the place up. And then obviously the passive system um, would, would, would um, you know, in terms of body heat and whatever, and would take over. So th there's a number of advantages to it. We will obviously use it as a trial and as a pilot as well for our own programme going forward. Uh, the reason we got one and twos is that it gives us flexibility, I suppose, in terms of single people, couples, or perhaps families with one child, because the two person units are large enough to place more than one bed um, in. And as I say, they're self contained little kitchenette um, area, a separate bathroom, um, and, and, and um, toilet area. Uh, they look really good. Um, the designs I've seen are, are exceptional. Andrew Freegard's been clearly leading on that. Um, but we will be reporting to Cabinet now very, very shortly on the phase two programme. Uh, whether uh, as I say, these will become a long term here or whether we will look at another council owned site to move the modular housing to in due course. Um, but certainly uh, it will be something that we may well look to expand on in the future if we can find the, uh, the, the a better site. Thank you, Mike. Very interesting. I shall watch that one with uh, keen interest. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, Co Councillor Christine Cave, if you'd like to ask your question now. Oh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I have a couple of questions actually on the back of the presentation. Uh, just to say, I don't think I did unmute myself. I think somebody else did, but uh, I did quickly once I realised I had been unmuted, muted. Um, so yes, first of all, I'm really, really pleased to see that the council have had a change of heart on the CCTV. Uh, because of, uh, obviously, as members will remember, this is something I've been pushing for for the last 18 months. I'm very pleased about that. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, on the projects, you say we were successful on the complex uh, needs in the modular housing, which is fantastic that the Welsh Government have uh, supported the funding of that. I wonder what projects they didn't fund. I wonder if you could give me some information about that. And um, I also note that obviously uh, the sad news of the demise of um, the uh, free newspaper, The Gem, and that we're now not able to uh, place our homes for you advert in there. And I do wonder if we could, um, you know, obviously if this is funding that's already been uh, allocated. I wonder if we could possibly think about relocating that funding to our local library services, who could well be a good place for people to go to if they can't access a um the advert uh, via the internet
Chair, would you like me to, to respond? Yes, sir. Who, yes, who would like Miles? to answer that, that question? Oh, you want Mike um, to answer it, in, Miles? In yeah, happy for Mike to answer, Chair. If if I take the second the second point around homes homes for you, we were already moving. I think uh, we'd reported to the scrutiny committee uh, in its last term. We'd already reported we were moving to a more digital and virtual uh, method of of managing um, housing applications going forward. And we have a online application form and and what have you. Um, in terms of advertising, yes, one of the issues that we have is that a, a large number of people won't necessarily be looking at the council's website to see what council properties are available for letting, or they may not have, have, have access digitally. Um, we, we already work very, very closely with colleagues in social services so that the most vulnerable um, with, within us, we provide the advert directly to social workers and to social uh, and health colleagues. So we send the advert as a, as a PDF to them for them to obviously then to discuss with their clients. Um, we also provide um, and have provided in the past um, the advert to libraries. And we've also discussed with certain GP surgeries as well, because um, it's another opportunity where there is public access. Um, I hadn't heard, um, obviously, with the necessarily with the de demise of the gem permanently. Uh, obviously, they haven't been running the advert for, for quite some time and people have been directed in the main to the council's website but um, I agree with you um, we can get that advert out in some form of form in lots of other public places um, to ensure that people have equal accessibility uh, to the properties and I think that's that's very very important um, in terms of the second point around CCTV um, uh, just to clarify there is a review of CCTV. It hasn't been concluded yet, and that 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 options report will be going to cabinet shortly. Um, there is a draft paper that's already been drafted, which I'm going through at the moment and sharing um, with colleagues. So it's imminent in terms of going to cabinet. I think there are a couple of things for us. Um, the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office. Um, are supporting of appointed a strategic lead for all Wales CCTV and a coordinator's position. Um, I mentioned a strategic group which I've been asked to sit on. Um, the first meeting um, I think was when uh, I think I was off a few weeks ago. Miles attended that meeting and the subsequent meeting will be coming up which I'll be attending uh, shortly. Um, I think it's Fair to say, if we're to wait for an all Wales CCTV solution, we'll still be here in three, four, five years' time. Um, and we don't have the money to be here in three, four, five years' time um, looking to support something um, on our own effectively, because it's just the council that contributes to that. We want to work with partners. We've had some positive discussions with the police locally around perhaps um, undertaking our own monitoring at the police station if there is um, space for, for that there. Um, I've had discussions with, um, or Deb, Deb Gibbs has had discussions with some police colleagues. There are a number of police officers that, that, that are currently desk bound for a variety of reasons, and they may be long-term desk bound. And we've had some initial discussions about whether some of those officers could actually assist us in terms of some of the monitoring if we are to take the monitoring back off Bridgend. Now, Bridgend currently monitor our CCTV and we are currently in, con well, we, we, we have a contract which is rolling over at the moment. Uh, we have to give notice if we wish to come out of that contract. Um, and one of the options obviously we'll be discussing with Cabinet is about, is about, is about potentially bringing the monitoring back because what we've identified certainly with the CCTV and the mobile cameras and the issues that we've had over the last three or four months, um, it, it's, it's easy to be far more flexible about what you see and when you see it and when you're looking at something is when you're in control of it. When you have a third party, a partner, as good as Bridgend are, um, you know, they may have I, I can't remember the entire uh, portfolio of cameras. You may have over 140 cameras in Bridgend and the Vale and two operators on at any one time. And obviously things take priority. I'm not saying the Vale doesn't, 
but um, there have been times when we'd look for, for footage and unfortunately the cameras have been pointed in the wrong direction when an incident has been ongoing, for example. So that's uh, one of the other options. So what we've got at the moment are the five mobile cameras. Uh, we will evaluate those as well. And what we're finding is that we're actually using the CCTV for the benefit of the council and the council residents rather than necessarily you know, the police want it for major crimes. That's the discussion that we had previously. Um, but clearly they've now become involved obviously in much more um, day-to-day community-based issues as we've been going through this period. Uh, tool, tool. You know, we have found it a useful tool, both as a deterrent, but also in terms of identifying crime when it happens. I think the challenge will be, and I said this to Deb, that the, the, the challenge will be, they are mobile, but um, I, I, I don't envy her discussion with the local community when we look to take a mobile camera from one location to place it somewhere else. But hopefully they won't have an issue by, uh, by the time that decision has, has been made. Okay. Okay, thank you. Are you okay with that, Christine? Any other further questions from there? Yes, yes I, did have a, I did have a question on the projects that weren't funded by Welsh Government, and, and that wasn't answered. Uh, apologies, Councillor Kay. The projects that generally weren't uh, supported were those where we would, where Welsh Government would effectively be paying capital funding direct to a landlord. Uh, we had a number of landlords who were prepared to um, provide or to, to purchase accommodation, but then needed to modify the accommodation, but didn't have the capital funds to do so. Welsh Government were reluctant um, uh, well, more than reluctant. Uh, they didn't. They don't want to fund direct um, private landlords in that way. Um, so there are a couple of things. There were a couple of projects that we thought were really useful. Um, we may look to our own capital program to help support some of those, because one of the problems that I think the private landlords had is that there's a requirement if you take the capital funding, it has to meet the Welsh government specification, which which is a very good specification, but it's a very high specification. We could still provide self-contained, um, really suitable accommodation, but perhaps below that standard, but it wouldn't have attracted the capital funding. So there are some things that we, we think we could look at using our own capital funding, and I mean housing capital funding now, um, within our own, within our own programme, and as I say, look to use the supporting people funding that we have to revenue some support some of that. Um, clearly, that you know, we can't build, we, we won't be able to build our way out of this quickly enough to accommodate that number of people. So it will be about how can we utilize some of the existing stock within the council. Um, I don't sure if Marcus is still on the call, but one of the things clearly we want to to look at is something around our empty homes and about what, how we could potentially blend perhaps some of that grant funding, you know, the, uh, the loan funding that private um, owners have access to in order to improve some of their accommodation to bring it back. So again, I think that will be another, uh, another string that we will explore, not that we're not already doing it, we have an empty home strategy and we're already trying to bring empty homes back, but perhaps you know, a bit more emphasis and a bit more leverage perhaps with some other private owners who, who might be willing to go out and buy empty private property and convert it. And then obviously we will work with them then in terms of the management of that stock. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, I think that was the second part of your question, Christine. So we've answered that now. So I think um, Councillor Nugent Finn, I think you had a question as well. I do. Thank you very much, Chair. I've got, I've got a couple of questions, actually. Um, I'm glad uh, uh, Councillor Bood asked about the modular housing. I just wondered if you could get, tell me who the house builder is. I, I believe it's, I think it's MMC stands for Modern Methods of Construction. Is that right? Yes, it does. Yeah, but that, yes. so I just wonder if we have any builders in, in, in mind. Um, when uh, Christine and I did the sleep out in Clanmar, we met um, one of the builders from Cardiff. I think he was employed with a very big 
uh, I won't mention any names, but do you remember it's about 17 uh, of these, Christine, and um, it's, it's an extremely successful project. And they, they're using it for um, uh, emergency housing placement for uh, drug and alcohol and, and most vulnerable people. So just another a bit of food for thought there, but um, I'm really excited about that. that. That's excellent. But if I could have any information on the, on the builders as well, that would be really useful. Um, I wondered if we could have an update as well on the Verlega Morgan's, uh, the WHQS status, how it looks across the Verlega Morgan, in particular Barry. Um, and I just wanted to ask about the uh, the CCTV. Actually, again, this is in my infancy in in this now, but uh, is it is it redeployable CCTV? I watched a fantastic documentary. Uh, on a lot of local authorities in England, actually, and they're having incredible results with regards to fly tipping in particular. So I just wondered if it's the same sort of CTV, you know, TV we're looking at um, at purchasing or, or upgrading. Um, and I just wanted to ask Marcus something if he's around still. He said that people, he said, weren't willing about the um, upgrade or repairs to council properties. I think that I think I'm not sure if that was meant in that context, but obviously it's difference between people not willing to or people wanting to minimise a risk. So perhaps a bit of clarification around that as well, please. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nugent Finn. So, uh, you, Mike, sure. are you going to answer these questions, or will it be Marcus? Is he still with us? Or I, I can answer the last question, um, but I'll let Mike go do some of the others. Perhaps if that's first, if that's okay. Yes, that's, yes, that's yes, fine. Sir. Thank you, Max. So, so very briefly, the, the contractor question, we obviously have to go through a procurement exercise in order to um, procure a contractor. Um, we're, not, we're, we're not obliged to choose clearly any one contractor. There is a framework being put together. One of the stipulations of the Welsh Government is obviously the Welsh pound being spent in Wales. Um, so um, we've been, Andrew Freegard has been to see a, a local builder who has developed MMC down in the rural Vale um, recently. Uh, he has a system which conforms with the Welsh Government requirement. Uh, we know that Passive House is a, a more national company, but obviously a lot of local authorities and RSLs in Wales are using a, a system called Passive House. Um, so we will go through a... a a framework exercise to choose a contractor but as I say we are mindful that we would want the Welsh money you know the Welsh pound spent in Wales so we'll be looking for a local contractor but as I say there are supply chain issues locally because that's that that's an embryonic business in Wales and it has to grow so it's a sort of chicken and egg until people start building MMC in volume the price is high and obviously there are very few um, um, alternative suppliers. So uh, I suppose it's us working in, in partnership, but that, that would be the procurement route. In terms of WHQS, uh, we, we've obviously achieved WHQS and we continue to work on the, um, uh, the next phase, which is about maintaining WHQS. There has been a delay, however, in uh, some of our external programmes this year. Um, Mark has mentioned earlier, but we had no contractors, contractors had closed down. We had issues with supplies, uh, a lot of supplies uh, dried up. We had difficulty getting kitchens and, you know, for some of the internals, we had difficulty getting kitchens and, and other materials that, that had dried up for a period as, as some of the builders merchants closed down as well. So that, that has set us back probably four or five months, but um, speaking to the, uh, the housing projects team only last week, um, we're picking up on that now. It, it didn't help. We lost our housing capital projects manager uh, right at the outset. So we've had to employ somebody at short notice um, on an agency basis to assist us in pulling the project work together. But we are back on track. Um, but some of the projects are going to be delayed. There'll be Some will be delayed into next year. But we're just starting to ramp up. Contractors are, are working well. WHQS, we still achieved WHQS. Um, and we're still required to do regular returns to Welsh Government um, advising of that. So I have no concerns or issues with regard to WHQS. And as I say, the contractors are busy for looking for work now as they, they obviously uh, come back to normal. 
Um, totally in terms understand of that and part, appreciate that, Mike, under the circumstances. Totally understand and appreciate that, yeah. Okay. In, in, terms, of last, in terms of your last point, the CCTV is, is a um, redeployable system, the five cameras that we purchased. Um, there are a couple of issues there is that the existing camera stock, and this will be in the report, the existing camera stock that we have is very old. You can't get spare parts for our cameras. Um, what we tend to have to do is decommission a camera to get the parts in order to put the parts on another camera where um, we, we, we need it. Um, however, I would say the redeployable cameras that we've got are exceptional. They, that they're, you know, that they are state of the art. They are the most modern technology that we have. And I think what we what we've been doing is to actually put fixed posts in these hotspot areas because these hotspot areas will become hotspot areas again in the future. So we've got a position then, and we just come along, we affix the camera. Um, there's no requirement for a necessarily then, you know, issues around hookups and all that sort of thing for power supplies and things. They're always there. Um, uh, and yeah, I, you know, we will see. Obviously, we, we uh, as I mentioned, we'll, choose, we'll we'll use it as a bit of a pilot to start off with, and we will do the review and the analysis. Um, but you know, the council made available three hundred thousand pounds worth of capital funding for CCTV renewal um, in terms of its cap, capital fund. Um, I think we've been fortunate. I think we've used some Section One Hundred Six. I I think. Um, um, Emma um, in in in, uh, in uh, the the neighbourhoods team. Um, I mean, one of the good things that we've great partnerships have evolved over the last six months. I think Miles has mentioned that um, there's very little red tape. We're having conversations about things that would have taken us months to have conversations about. Um, but we've done some really good work with Emma's team in the neighbourhoods about getting these cameras and 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 some of the funding. Um, and some of the work with the enforcement team, the enforcement team have been absolutely, you know, they've had a difficult job, a really, really difficult job over the last few months. Um, you know, the seaside issues, the issues around roofs and Ogmore and car parks and, and whatever, um, but they've been fantastic. So, yeah, so they are redeployable, they're state of the art, um, and we're hoping to get, to, as I say, to get some great stuff from it. Oh, thank you, thank you, Mike. Uh, Miles, did you want to come in briefly? Uh, and um, Marcus has still got to answer something. And then I've got uh, Councillor Sally Hanks and Councillor Bronwyn Brooks then. So Miles and then Marcus first, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just I, I, as Mike alluded to, I, I uh, attended the first meeting of the strategic CCTV group. But I, just to give you a bit of background to that, if you remember when we came to you previously, um, the council was was very generous to have put three hundred thousand pounds into the capital programme for sort of a new CCTV system. We we weren't saying we weren't going to have any. We were saying we're going to fundamentally change some of the analog systems we've got, some of which are in the wrong place, all of which is out of date. And, and as Mike said, you can't you can't get spare parts for. What we said to the police was, uh, and to the crime commissioner's office, you actually fund CCTV in other police commissioner areas. You fund it in full. You provide no contribution whatsoever to the Vale of Morgan providing this service. So we, I wrote to the ACC, and I also, I also wrote to um, the commissioner's office, and I, I think I started a bit of a storm really, because then the police uh, set up this strategic group to look at CCTV across Wales. And as, as Mike has said, I think whilst the initiative sounds laudable, it, it'll take years if it, if it has, ever does happen. And I know it's, it's one of the things that Michael wanted, wanted to happen. The options for us, I think seeming that there's no money coming forward is that we would probably want to control our own cctv if, if we're going to if the council's going to spend the money then we will cite it somewhere where we can access the cameras and we can control it like we have with enforcement because as money gets tighter we need to make sure it's targeted properly so the options that you would be asked to consider will be based around um citing the the, the camera stations in a place where we can look at them so as mike said we may get um some of the police who are in the same building as us to to help with monitoring but um, if they're not contributing, the, the, the system will be set up for, for our needs, for, for, for crime needs, yes, um, but also for community safety and antisocial behaviour and for looking at issues such as fly tipping, which um, I know is, is, is you know top of my mailbag often. Um, so just to be clear, more modern system, um, able to be redeployed, some fixed units possibly in town centres where we've got our biggest issues, um, but a much more agile system than, than we've actually got now. But 
it's something that the council will be investing in and I think if the police want to have a say in, in, in how it's used and, and how it's deployed, they should contribute um, because they are contributing in other council areas. So it'll be a very interesting report and it will come to this committee after speaking to Cabinet because I know you want to be having a say on it. Um, but we've got some really good ideas about how this should be run and how you can get really major impacts from CCTV because we've really not had the benefit of, of the system that we got in place for the last five years or so. So just to, just that, just to clarify, because I, I did the first meeting, we are involved in the strategic group because we figured it's better to be in a tent than outside. But the group has no powers in terms of what this council does. In fact, it's useful for us for learning, um, but it has no powers. It, it will not dictate as to what we do in terms of our CCTV. That will be up to you. Okay. Uh, you thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miles. Uh, Marcus, did you just want to answer the end of Councillor Nugent Finn's uh, her question and then we'll go to Councillor Sally Hanks before Councillor Bronwyn Brooks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to say that, um, just to explain that the Disabled Facilities Grant team, um, they only work with properties which are private sector properties, so um, they don't actually do work on council properties. So what, what we were experiencing when the lockdown uh, happened was that um, obviously uh, as a private property owner, they have to be willing to let um, firstly, occupation therapists in, and secondly, builders in to do the work. Uh, and obviously, uh, in, in many cases, those people were either shielding or, or had residents in the house who were shielding, and they weren't willing to have either builders or even occupational therapists in the house. So that did lead to problems, but on and delays. But um, yes, uh, that 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 situation has moved on. Obviously, with the shield, it changes the shielding, but also with um, people obviously wanting to get work done. Uh, to help them live in their properties but um but that was the reason why um we weren't able to get into properties okay thank you thank you for clarifying that point marcus uh, if we can go to councillor sally hanks thank you thank you chair i just wanted to say a big thank you to all senior officers but in particular to the community safety team of the anti-social behavior because they've gone um, a, a beyond what they've had to do, their statistics are huge, and and also to the homeless team. I think I'd like you know we do appreciate the hard hard work that so many people have put in. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sally. Um, Councillor Andrew Parker is after Bronwyn Brooks. I saw your hand. Thank you, Chair. It's actually just, as uh, Sally said, said exactly part of what I was actually going to say, is around thanking all the officers, and all, but also all the staff who've been out on the roads, um, you know, out collecting our bins and, and trying to help with all these issues that are around, but also with the, you know, dealing with their own concerns and fears and uh, and sometimes illness around around COVID. So, you know, I, I think as a committee, I think I would just like to put on record, I'll, I'll thank you. And to all the staff, all the officers, directors, for the, for their dedication, and for actually trying to get out there and keep working in quite often some difficult circumstances. Um, so I would just like to—I think we should actually put on, on on paper actually our thanks, and you know thank them for their support for keeping our council afloat and going, and trying to look after all our residents. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bronwyn Brooks. Um, Councillor Andrew Parker, you wanted to come in. Michael, I think we might have lost your picture. Are you still there? We lost Michael, I think. Miles can answer. Miles can help, though. Miles, um, talking about this accommodation thing for the homeless, I'm a. Ah, oh, there we are. Michael's back. Sorry. Can sorry. You... sorry I... Yeah, good. Um, it's just by way of sort of trying to understand the position of. Uh, properties in the Vale. I, I am aware of a hotel that is coming on the market very quickly that's got eight bedrooms and 14 small studio apartment units which would actually totally be ideal for single or double persons. Are we able to buy these properties and manage them or are you looking for private sector people to buy them and they will then manage them with you? Okay. Did you get me? Who would I like think... to answer that one? Um, I, I I keep going, turning my, I keep turning my, yes, I did. 
I, I keep turning my camera on and off. I think I have a terrible connection, a home connection. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, Councillor Parker, it's probably the latter in that we would ordinarily look to work with a private um, landlord who would be investing themselves. And we would obviously provide some form of revenue and management support to uh, that landlord. Um, but it may well be, as I say, that we would look to come forward in the future and we may need to increase the number of temporary units that we have in our management. Uh, certainly, if you are aware of somebody that is uh, of an establishment of that nature, um, certainly if you'd like to put them in touch with me, I'd certainly like to have a conversation with them. Yeah, yes, I, I, I'm thinking particularly because of the tight, tight time scale, uh, this, this, this property is just about to come on the market. It, it is probably as ideal as you could get. Um, and clearly you could actually purchase it before the end of the financial year. But what I'll do is I'll speak with you tomorrow, uh, Michael, and I'll give you the, it's actually got a planning consent, so you can actually call up on the planning, but I'll give you those details tomorrow. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. I think everybody's asked a question who wanted to ask a question. Thank you, absolutely. Um, uh, um, and I think, yeah, Thank you for the, the report, um, Miles. I think it's quite detailed because obviously, you know, for a lot of our, the councillors, we've been uh, sort of shut away from sort of council business to a certain extent. We've had sort of up to date reports from um, sort of the leader and from um, the uh, managing director on a regular basis. But it's just nice to know what has been happening um, with staff and with services over the COVID um, period. And um, obviously, as chair of um, the committee. I'd like to echo what um, Councillor Hanks and Councillor Bronwyn Brooks said: is that we would like to, um, you know, uh, thank uh, the uh, the managers and especially the staff, you know, who've been on the front line doing all the work that they have. We appreciate all the extra hours that everybody has put in, um, you know, to keep this council going while COVID, um, you know, has forced us into lockdown. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting, you know, sort of talking about what we're going to be doing in the future. Yes, we're going to recover from this, but we're going to think about different ways of doing things and things like that. And I think that's um, might be within the next report, um, but also shows that a lot of workers are, are happy to work from home and do a mixture of things as well. And I think that sort of makes a more agile workforce in a way. Um, and I think some of the things I would also like to ask perhaps Mike about the, um, the housing trading account and perhaps Marcus about the uh, disabled, I can't say disabled funding grant. Um, Michael, you said that we would have a report probably the end of the year, we would have an idea whether we're able to have sort of, um, sort of October, November, some idea of where things are as well, whether the committee could have just have something like that. So we know where we are um, and just how we're getting on with the modular housing things because I think everybody's interested in that and I'm assuming that obviously you're going to be recording the uh, the de redeployable CCTV statistics um, when those are available that would be appreciated by this committee as well but thank you for the discussion there um, I think that was a really worthwhile discussion and yeah uh, I know that um, Mark who's the officer for this committee will make sure that we recorded our thanks for all the hard work that you've done. But if you could also um, relay this committee's thanks to your um, staff members from us as well, we would really appreciate that as well. So, so that's uh, Miles, Mike and Marcus as well. If you could do that, we'd appreciate that. Um, so I think the next one is, Miles, are you up again now? Um, yes, Chair. Thank you. It's, there's a hell of a lot of paper here. I, I'll, I won't take you through all of it, but I'll try and give okay. you a pricey so you can all get your head around it because it, it took me a while to get my head around it. Um, essentially, this, this is the council's new way of reporting performance. Um, and you will note that it's not scrutiny committee based. So it's essentially the whole council document. So performance across all our areas. Um, we produced a new corporate plan, as you're aware, which starts from this year and runs five years, so 2020 to 25. And we have a legal requirement under the Local Government Wales Measure and the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act to produce an annual report on our performance. So what this is, is the first quarter performance report for the entire council. So 
essentially it's come in front of you today for agreement but what will happen in future is we will present the elements within this report as pertinent to this committee because there's a lot of information to read there and, it, and it's well it's very useful and then obviously we want to, we want to focus uh, the the performance that we provide you within the remit of the committee so i'm pleased to say that despite the fact that we've been in the middle of a pandemic we've um our actions and our performance indicators are showing an amber. So they're not, they're not green, but they're not red either. So I think that's a testament to the comments that you made about our staff who have still been putting in the work wherever they're, wherever they're doing it. And I gave you an example um, of, of how we've still managed to keep 70% recycling performance. So, I mean, that's more to do with our residents uh, as much as it's to do with us. So this report will come to you quarterly. Um, what you'll see in terms of Appendix 1 and 2, which is the, at the back of the document, is the four new well-being objectives and the performance indicators and actions that's related to those. So essentially what we have is um, new four, four new objectives and everything we do in terms of our service plans, which are our directorate based plans, are aimed at achieving those objectives. What you'll see at Appendix 1 and 2 at the back of the report is the far right hand column shows the relevant committee that those actions and those uh, indicators belong to. So it does show that you have obviously a whole range of them in this committee. But what we'd like to do, perhaps not dwell too much on the detail of this report, partly because it's produced in the middle of a pandemic, so it's not really a fair judgment of our performance, but partly because when, when you see it again, um, when we do the next quarter, we'll be providing a presentation much more targeted on the actual requirements of this committee, and one by which then you can set your forward work programme. So this is the current position as it stands. Um, rather, as I say, than go through the report in detail, perhaps I'll just open it up to questions, Chair, because it is it is very, very detailed. Um, but we will make it more focused for you because we're very aware that if we produce this heavy tube of information every quarter, it's difficult to focus your work within the remit of the committee. So when you see it again, um, either myself or Mike will be providing a presentation on the aspects of this annual report that's relevant to, to your remit, and you can challenge us on those or anything within this plan that's outside of your remit is a, a matter for you. So I suppose in summary, a reasonably good performance for the three months that we've been in lockdown. Um, to come out of this with an amber and some of our work progressing as normal as can be is really good. Testament to the staff, as I say. Um, there's more work to do, clearly, because some of the things have, have, have dropped by the wayside because we've been reprioritising a lot of our staff. Um, so staff in, the, in less priority work have been put into issues such as social care, um, handing out PP, that sort of thing. So that's why there's some areas of performance that are down. Also, issues like Mike has mentioned, if we don't have the um, confidence of our tenants to go into their properties quite rightly because they're feeling vulnerable, then you're not going to see really good performance in terms of repairs um, because there's other reasons why we can't make those repairs like we, like we normally would. So, Chair, perhaps I'll open it to questions because um, if I go through this report, we could be here a while. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to go straight to questions. Is everyone else happy to go straight to questions? Yes. Councillor Bronwyn Brooks to begin with. Anybody else? want? And Councillor Andrew Parker. Sally Hanks as well. Okay. Um, I was actually going to say, I, I, I think uh, the report is, is huge. It is huge. I, I did try going through it all properly, um, but ended up thinking this is going to be just too big and I was a bit fearful that we would end up with this um, every quarter so I'm really happy Miles to hear you say that actually you're going to hone this down then for the next time it comes to us that to actually things that are relevant to this committee so so I'm happy to accept this report as it is at the moment particularly in where we've come from just coming out of a pandemic and not knowing if we're going to end up going back into it into the second wave so I'm happy to accept this as, as it is and look forward then to the next uh, report when we can actually look at it and hopefully things might be a little bit clearer and we're a bit further down the line as well then. Okay, so, um, yes Miles if you want to come back. Sorry just to add, I should have said that, that, that we're not actually designing this presentation um, because we like the look of it. We're, we're Tom Barron's team's working with a group of elected members, I'm not sure who is working on that but we will produce the report that you want. So if you want challenging information and you want just the reds, just the ambers, and you want to just, you know, not have a great discussion on the greens, then that's what it'll look like. So it's important that it's the report you want. And I, and I, I knew members would say that about this report. It's, it's, it's not 
targeted enough on, on your committee. Um, but it's important we showed you the first quarter, and what we'll do is show you this again, but then we'll have a presentation specific to your committee in future. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Sally Hanks, did you want to? Oh, no, sorry, Councillor Andrew Parker, and then it's Sally Hanks. Bear with me. Yes, no, I was just going to say that uh, quite clearly with 111 pages or however many it was, I mean, full marks to the people that even put it together, let alone the people that actually wrote the report. Um, I, I mean, four or five pages of an, a summary would probably help us all because I can't believe any of us are ever going to manage to digest over 100 pages. But well, well done, Miles and whoever did it. Sally Hanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to know um, some information about CV1. I see that 96% um, of customers' inquiries were resolved at first contact, which I think is excellent. The only thing is making contact seems to be getting harder and harder. Um, and I do have an awful lot of people complaining about the length of time they're taking to get through. But I think they're happy with the outcome. But I don't know if there's been a problem recently or um, perhaps you could um, enlarge on that, please. Certainly, Chair. I, I, I met with Tony Curtis yesterday in terms of the performance of the team during lockdown. And it, it's fair to say there were some issues. Um, a lot of them had to be recited because the, the technology is such that it doesn't work well from home. So there was a period, and I think he's coming out of that now, where call lengths and waiting durations were, were, were too long. So if you like, what I can do um, is ask that he produces a report for the next committee uh, in terms of performance, because as, as I, you rightly point out, if you can get through, the outcome is great. Um, but if you don't get through, the outcome is terrible, isn't it? I mean, and it's not picked up anywhere. So he, I know he does have information on calls that drop out. So if I could, if I could speak to him also of this committee, if you, if you like, then I could ask if he could produce a report, um, probably benchmarking his performance outside of the pandemic with with during, to to see what the effect on that was on our customers, because he he is the the inbox, if you like, to all our services, Mike's, Emma's, um, uh, Dave Holland's, because they take all the calls through. So. If, if uh, Chair and Sally, you're happy, I'll ask if Tony will produce a performance report for the next committee that you can have a look at in detail. Yeah, that would be really helpful. Yes, please. That would be that would be very helpful. Um, so I think, um, yeah, this report is yes, very very detailed and just shows you know sort of how well I think the council has done within very difficult circumstances. Um, uh, and if I've uh, looked rightly, I think I only noted there, there was only a, a very few sort of red ones, but they were ones that we've already discussed anyway, and ones that people wouldn't have been able to perform on anyway. I think it was partnership uh, to maximise uh, uh, additional affordable homes and things like that. Well, that wasn't going to happen in lockdown and things like that. So I think, you know, we have done quite well. Perhaps, um, so we used to have the report, whether it uh, where it was just um, sort of homes and, and um, say communities, whether we're able to have sort of like a pricey of that one at the beginning, um, by all means, you know, I'm sure we're happy to have a look through everybody else's as well to our leisure, but it, whether when it is reported again, we could just have the pricey of that. And it would, it is always good to know the green and the ambers as well as the reds, um, you know, sort of to know exactly where we are with everything as well, if that's possible, Miles. Yeah, certainly, Chair. I, th I think the, the views of, of members are, are really important because that, that shapes how it looks. We're talking about um, uh, presentations on screens with, with, with uh, some, some graphics to, sh to show at a first glance how we're performing. So we'll work with you on how that looks. But it's important that it's, it's quick and the information is there yes. and that you don't look too hard for yes. it because yes. there's a lot of, lot of words, isn't it, on here? And, and, and you know, it. I'm not trying to trick anybody, but you, you'd have to be, you know, to spend a lot of time on it to find to find the detail that you want. So that's not that's not acceptable. So in the report, it does say that we have this group set up, and we'll be doing a summary specific of this committee for the next for the next uh, next uh, meeting. Yes, that would be great. I mean, one question I did have on there, I was I was the person who went through it all and put sticky notes on everyone that was homes and safe communities on there. So I've got 
20,000 sticky notes on there. But um, the dark um, team, there was um, something introduced from Cardiff, the DRIVE um, project. What does DRIVE actually stand for to do with the um, domestic abuse side of things? They said that that would more than likely be introduced into the Vale. Whether my colleague Mike can provide you the uh, words for that acronym, I, I would defer to him, but we may have to come back to you on that if, if Mike's not able to do that. Yeah, no, that, that, that'd that be great. Okay, so are we happy to to accept this um, report as is, and then the next one that we get out, we can um, sort of scrutinise that in greater depth then. Yes, everyone happy with that? Oh, Andrew. Yes, okay, fantastic. Okay, so that was agenda items. Seven. Sorry, so agenda item. Sorry, eight. Chair. Can I, I? Sorry. Sorry, Chair. Just very briefly. Drive. It's an intensive intervention program which works very intensively with uh, perpetrators and survivors. Just for you to know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's great. Thank you. So, um, agenda item eight, and I think we have Laura to do this one. Is that correct, Laura? Nice to see you, Laura. Can you actually see me? I can't see myself at all. So, and you can hear me okay? Brilliant. Yes, yes, we can hear you okay. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, this is the first budget report that we've actually presented to scrutiny since the lockdown. So, it's the position as at the end of July 2020. And um, it's clearly quite repetitive of what we've already been hearing this evening it's it's the same themes that are obviously causing issues uh, they're causing work for the, the teams and the, obviously there's pressure then on the budgets so um starting with the revenue position um at year end at the moment we are still forecasting a balanced budget but clearly going into winter another potential lockdown another pandemic uh, crisis who knows um how that's actually going out turn by year end but obviously as as things uh develop we'll we'll keep you uh, keep you informed but at this point as at the end of july we're forecasting a, a, a balanced budget um the current budget positions for each budget head are outlined in paragraph 2.2 to 2.6 but the main issues are in 2.4 and 2.5 which as i say we, we've already uh, gone through this evening with with Mike and Miles and and Marcus. Uh, we've got the homelessness position where an awful lot of work and expense has been uh, undertaken to make sure that our homeless uh, um, residents are, are are home safely during the pandemic. And uh, till now, and as Mike has said, until the end of March, that's going to be funded from Welsh government funding. But clearly, there's the issue beyond that. Um, um, whether we can get things in place to, to mitigate those costs. Um, again, the antisocial behaviour with the community safety team has put the, the impetus back on uh, CCTV positions. So we've mentioned that the, uh, the £350,000 is being spent, the capital money is now rolling on and actually being spent, which is good to see. Uh, and the other one that's been mentioned in paragraph 2.5 is the disabled facilities grants where again Marcus has said clearly lack of access to vulnerable properties um, they have not managed to get the works uh, completed on profile so that has a, a double impact with disabled facilities grants it has an impact on the capital budget in that we can't spend the capital but also there's a, a fee target on the revenue budget so that's down because clearly the works aren't being done and the fees aren't being earned so it mentions there that quarter one the fee income was uh, only £5,000 on a profile of 36. So clearly they're hoping that things are going to pick up as, as we move through, but with winter coming, who knows, as everyone says. So uh, say so slightly repetitive theme in the report, but you know, it's what we would expect. Um, and the other issue then is the capital programme. So Appendix 1 lists the, the schemes that have been approved. And again, at the start of the year, we had a £33 million approval budget of which because of delays and issues and reprofiling uh, officers have taken the early decision to slip or transfer quite a lot of that budget forward so they're slipping nine million pounds off the 33 forward to next year as we're literally having uh, 
uh, access problems and, and progress issues with some of the um, capital projects, which is not unexpected. So, in a nutshell, that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for updating us on that. And I think, yes, I think as a, a committee, sort of, we are aware that you know, has been talked about previously. There's not a lot that could have been done around uh, budgeting and spending <laughs> and trying to spend the money um, in the lockdown and stuff. Does anybody have any questions for Laura? Or are we happy to note this and we'll have a see how we're getting on next month then? Everyone happy to note? Yes. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for um, for coming along and talking us through that. It was nice to see you again. Right. Okay. So uh, if we can move to agenda item nine, um, that's uh, I'll hand over to hand over to Mark. Um, yep. Thank you, Chair. Hope everyone can hear me. Okay. Okay, um, for this report, it's the delayed fourth quarter scrutiny decision tracking the recommendations and our updated work program schedule for the remainder of 2020-21. Um, as usual, uh, the report advises members of progress in relation to scrutiny committee's recommendations and confirms the updated work program schedule for 2021. Um, Essentially, uh, Appendix A is the fourth quarter, which would have been January to March 2020. Um, obviously, that only encompasses January to February now. Um, as we can see on Appendix A, currently um, all the um, recommendations from that period are showing as complete. Um, if we turn now to the Appendix B, C, and D. These are the outstanding um, recommendations for those periods. Um, in general, with these, they're currently showing still as ongoing because simply of the COVID situation, um, the items have just not been able to be dealt with as yet. Um, as we go forward with the remainder of the municipal year, um, we'll be looking through these decisions again, and I will be liaising with Mike and other um, officers in order to get these resolved and then updated with yourselves um, at the next quarter. Moving on to Appendix E. Um, this is actually the, obviously the main updated work program schedule. Um, currently, it is pared down, um, obviously, because of the COVID situation. So it's showing mainly the key reports that need to come to the committee for review. Um, obviously, there are some that are mentioned further down um, below the actual main work programme that the committee usually uh, deal with, but at the moment are on hold until we can allocate them to a suitable date. Um, obviously, this is at the moment a very much a baseline program. So obviously, as we move through the year, um, new things will be added uh, onto it. Obviously, we've had a bit of that tonight uh, with Miles and Mike with the presentation and the annual report. Um, that there will be items potentially that we can add on to there as we go through the year. Um, I just refer very quickly to Appendix F. Um, which basically outlines the emergency power decisions that were taken during the national lockdown. And uh, we'd be noted in context to the usual committee's um, business and the forward work programme planning as well. Um, essentially, um, looking to committee uh, on any views on appendices A, B and C and D. And also then, obviously, if they are happy at the moment for the forward work programme, in this very sort of baseline format to go onto the council's website. And obviously, as we move through the year, it will evolve and it will change. And, the, and that change document will be going onto the website as we go forward. Okay. Um, committee, Councillor Christine Cave. Anybody else want to speak after Christine as well? Councillor Sally Hanks. Anybody else? No. Okay. So, Christine, if you'd like to go first. 
Yes, thank you for that, Chair. Um, I'm interested in uh, Appendix B uh, because uh, the item reported on the 10th of December 2019 was an item that had really slipped. Um, and when it was put on the agenda, um, the, the last time we spoke about this, uh, which was probably uh, the end of the year, probably uh, December 2019, um, I was uh, concerned then and I think um, if memory serves me well I was told that we were actually waiting for a report to go to cabinet and I have some recollection of that report um, possibly going uh, to cabinet or possibly being produced and going to cabinet uh, somewhere around the beginning of January February I might be out with time but I certainly know that all we were waiting for was a report and I know officers obviously in the council have uh, been preoccupied with COVID-19, but it would be helpful if we had a, an update here. Uh, thank you, Christine. Is that, that's the one, uh, um, appendix B, uh, the report identifying the appropriate housing solution for the traveller community site. I think, um, I think there is um, sort of an update on that because I know it has gone out um, to try and find sites, hasn't it? And I think that was within the thing in the report. But if Mike, if you want to come in and expand on that, that'd be great. Yeah, I think I think your memory is is probably correct, Councillor Cave. Um, I think uh, I gave a response saying that we were due to take a report in terms of the outcomes of that exercise, that call for sites, candidate sites. I think. Um, from my memory, I, I'll be honest with you, we haven't done any work on it uh, for the last few months, um, certainly since since March time. I recall a conversation, unfortunately Marcus isn't, I think Marcus left the call now. I remember a conversation with colleagues in planning who were leading on the candidate sites and call for sites. And I think we were looking to bring a report to Cabinet in May. I think it was in terms of the outcome of that piece of work. Um, I'm afraid I can't, give you an up-to-date response tonight because as I say I'm I'm not acutely aware of where that report was um, or exactly what was what, what was the state of play um, but I'm happy to bring I'm happy to bring an update back to scrutiny committee for the next meeting if that would would assist or provide an update to members outside the meeting if you require that sooner um, yes I think we We'd like a, a, a report to uh, scrutiny committee if, if you have that available. That would be uh, worthwhile. Um, sort of having on having that available, Mike. Uh, yes, Christine, if you want to come back. Chair, yes, uh, because this has gone on for such a long time, I do wonder. Um, if um, Mike Ingram does have in, any information available for the committee in advance of the uh, uh, October meeting, um, you know whether that could be made available to us as soon as he has it. Mike, are you able to to do that, or would you want to compile stuff? Yes, sir. yes, yes. Yes, perfectly happy. As I say, it was one of the, the, the options. Yes, I can I can give members of uh, committee an update uh, outside of the meeting. Um, Fantastic. I'll liaise with Mark um, with Mark to get that circulated. Because I think we were looking for suitable sites, weren't we? And I don't think any's um, come forward, has it? When it went out um, to the you know to the wider public, I think that was one of the things that we'd ask you know that the Vale were hoping to to get um, recently. I don't think anything's actually come back to the veil no one's actually said that they've got a suitable site no i think i i think you're right i think we we'd obviously looked at the uh, sites in council ownership previously as a, a piece of work as a council um we've then gone out and obviously to the candidate site to ask whether there are expressions of interest i think from that perspective my recollection was that they we were then going to advertise more widely i can't i as i say, i'm, I'm not 100 percent certain what that decision was um, to explore other avenues and it was on the basis then of that report then coming back so as I say if if members are content um, as I say I'll speak to colleagues in planning and we'll send an update through Mark in lieu of a report then to to scrutiny next okay that's great so it was going to be Sally Hanks next but Andrew did you want to come in on just this I'm point just, here? yeah I was just going to say 
Uh, I mean, it's a long time ago, but my memory was when we had a meeting, February probably, Victoria was actually, they were going to start the whole process again because of the complications with the assembly and the fact that the original site, which Mike will remember, um, if it didn't fill up and we couldn't collect the money, they wanted the money back. So we really went straight on to rehab, but of course now because of the uh, COVID and everything, I think really the thing is just frozen in time at the moment. Um, but equally, I actually think that the fundamental information that the assembly were looking for, for the number of pitches, which basically went for the travellers, and I think looking at Michael to see whether he nods, the travellers and the gypsies were not prepared, or the travellers and the Roman community, however politically correct the phrase is, um, were not likely to gel on one site. So I think we've got a, a major um, reappraisal, which really can't go on for some time. So I hope that helps. Uh, but probably the answer is if Vicky could actually, Victoria Robinson, sorry, uh, could give us an update. I think that might be the best way forward. Yes, th thank you, Councillor Parker. So, um, Mike, would you be working with uh, Victoria Robinson on on that? Yes. Oh, that yes. that'll be that'll be lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so, Councillor Sally Hanks, if you want to come in now. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick question. The digital um, tablets that are out in the community, did we find a way of wiping them uh, and are they in use now? Um, yes, that would be very interesting to know. I, I know that we were, we've had lockdown, but we were in February, we asked if we could have a report on that, didn't we, to come back to us again at a later point. Um, mm. So. Um, yeah, that would be interesting to know um, whether they've resolved that issue about being able to wipe the tablets so that they can go out and be lent uh, more speedily. Would committee um, like me? To, sorry, would committee like me to get an update uh, with regard to that point rather than to bring it back or bring another report back um, on that very specific point? If I can speak to Tony Curlis and we can provide that information. Yeah, and if you could email us all round, but I'd hoped that they would have found a way and they would be up and in use because they would be quite valuable, at, uh, you know, during the pandemic. So an email letting us know would be great. Thank you, Mike. Yes, that'd be that'd be great. I don't think anyone else has any more questions, do we? So we sort of note the forward work programme. As uh, Mark uh, has said, this is just your basic one at the moment. There will be uh, other reports coming on to it as we um, move out of this lockdown and hopefully stay out of lockdown um, and that we can do more work uh, within the council then and do our Sorry. job as scr scrutiny committee. Okay, but thank you everyone for attending this evening. I think that was the last one. Sure, just a very quick one, just to obviously for committee to approve that for it to be uploaded onto the website. Oh, yes. They're happy for it as is. Yes. Is everyone happy as is? To yeah. be uploaded onto the website? Sorry, Mark. Okay, no, no, no problem. Great, thank you. Thanks, committee. Thank you, Chair. Okay, does anyone else have anything last to say before we finish the meeting? No? Thank you everybody for attending. It was great to see you all. Again, uh, I think we've had some really good discussions this evening and really interesting questions. Uh, but thank you very much and thank you again for your hard work as um, officers and staff of the, the Vale Council. We really appreciate all the hard work that you've undertaken yeah. over the, over these uh, and, trying few, few months. Yeah. Compliments to Mark too, because this meet meeting is the best one I've attended and it's actually gone off extremely well. Yeah, and a good chair as well. She's hand, hand <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Chair. <laughs> Rachel can feed the cat now. Go and feed the cat. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get out the door now. That's the only problem. Thank you very much, though. Good night, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.